to welcome Nancy Marie Brown, who hails from northern Vermont, where she lives with her husband, the writer Charles Fergus, Icelandic horses, and an Icelandic sheepdog. Um, she is the acclaimed author of seven books, including Song of the Viking, which I was supposed to hold up, but I dropped it in the back, so she'll hold it up when she gets up here. <laughs> and um, The Far Traveler, Voyages of a Viking Woman, which is where I first heard of her, her, her books. Um, I understand that she became interested in the Icelandic sagas when she was studying in school. She had a professor that let her read through the, his bookshelves, and she ran out of translated books and had to learn the languages in order to keep reading, and it's just gone on from there. Um, she reads Icelandic and Old Norse and speaks as well? Yes, when I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, in this book, The Ivory Vikings, she delves into the mystery, it's nonfiction, she delves into the mystery of the Lewis Chessman, but she brings the history so to life, um, the mythology, the background, by describing the individual personalities and the social structures, the art and the architecture, as well as the unique landscape and the political culture. It's um, very, very alive. And uh, I just want to recommend that after you read The Ivory Vikings and appreciate the really fascinating backstory that Nancy uh, paints, I recommend you read Peter May's most recent novel, The Chessmen, um, which feature, in a very fictional mystery way, the, uh, the, the, the pieces that, that we learn the background of. So, but don't read um, that until you've read the first two. Right. Yeah, that's true. It's a fairness <laughs> series. Um, and if you've read these, these, this series by Peter May, you have to read The Highway Vikings to understand the backstory. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Nancy Brown. It's really wonderful to see so many people here. I love it when uh, bookstores have to bring out more chairs. I have a couple of uh, little buttons. You can take oh, cool. one. There may not be enough to go around. Um, and also the three little replicas here of the chess map. Uh, you can come up and take a look at them afterwards if you like. I, I hesitate to send them around because they really want to climb in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Very appealing little characters. Um, as you heard, this is more a biography, I think, of it than a history. It's a biography of a set of objects, these Lewis Chessmen. And the story that they tell spans the medieval Norse world. From Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, to Scotland, Iceland, and Greenland, from the New World all the way to Baghdad. It covers 500 years of history, from the mid-700s to the 1200s, and then I skip to the 1800s and the present day when the after the chessmen were actually found again. It includes history, art history, literature, archaeology, forensics, and game design. So something for everybody. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a brief reading from the introduction. In the early 1800s, on a golden Hebridean beach, the sea exposed an ancient treasure cache 92 game pieces carved of ivory and the buckle of the bag that once contained them. 78 are chessmen, the Lewis chessmen, the most famous chessmen in the world. Between one and five eighths and four inches tall, these chessmen are Norse Netsuki, each face individual, each full of quirks. The kings stout and stoic, the queens grieving or aghast, the bishops moon-faced and mild, the knights are dowdy, if a bit ludicrous, on their cute ponies. The rooks are not castles, but warriors, some going berserk, biting their shields in battle frenzy. <laughs> only the pawns are lumps, simple octagons, and few at that, only 19, though the 14 plain discs could be pawns or men for a different game, like checkers. Altogether, the horde held almost four full chess sets, only one knight, Four rooks and 44 pawns are missing, about three pounds of ivory treasure. Who carved them? Where? How did they arrive in that sandbank? Or, as another account says, that underground cyst on the Isle of Lewis in westernmost Scotland? No one knows for sure. History, too, has many pieces missing. <laughs> 
To play the game, we fill the empty squares with pieces of our own imagination. Instead of facts about these chessmen, we have clues. Some come from medieval sagas, others from modern archaeology, art history, forensics, and the history of board games. The story of the Lewis chessmen encompasses the whole history of the Vikings in the North Atlantic from 793 to 1066, when the sea road connected places we think of as far apart and culturally distinct, Norway and Scotland, Ireland and Iceland, the Orkney Islands and Greenland, the Hebrides and Newfoundland. Their story questions the economics behind the Viking voyages to the west, explores the Viking impact on Scotland, and shows how the whole North Atlantic was dominated by Norway for almost 500 years until the Scottish king finally claimed his islands in 1266. It reveals the struggle within Viking culture to accommodate Christianity, the ways in which Rome's rules were flouted, and how orthodoxy eventually prevailed. And finally, the story of the Lewis Chessman <coughs> brings from the shadows an extraordinarily talented woman of the 12th century, Margaret the Adroit of Iceland. The Lewis Chessmen are the best known Scottish archaeological treasure of all time. To David Caldwell, former curator at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, where 11 of the Chessmen now reside, they may also be the most valuable. <coughs> Quote, it is difficult to translate that worth into money, he and Mark Hall wrote in a museum guidebook in 2010, and practically impossible to measure their cultural significance and the enjoyment they have given countless museum visitors over the years. Or, as Caldwell phrased it to me over tea one afternoon in the museum's cafeteria, if you knew what they were valued at, you wouldn't want to pick one up. <laughs> Too late for that. I'd already spent an hour handling four of them. Out of their, their glass display case, they're impossible to resist warm and bright, seeming not old at all, but strangely alive. They nestle in the palm, smooth and weighty, ready to play. Set on a desktop in lieu of the 32-inch square chessboard they'd require, they make a satisfying click. So tonight, I'm not going to tell you how the luxury trade in walrus ivory shaped the Viking Age. I'm not going to explore the sea road that connected Norway, Scotland, and Iceland for over 400 years. I'm not going to explain how Christianity came to the Viking world and the changes that ensued. And I'm not even going to tell you who the berserks were or why one is on my button. <laughs> what I want to focus on tonight is the woman in my subtitle, Margaret the Adroit, who was the best ivory carver in Iceland around the year 1200, and her patron. Bishop Hall of Scalholt. People often ask me, how did you get in interested in this story? Now, what made you write this book? I met Bishop Hall when I was writing my previous book, Song of the Vikings, Snorri and the Making of Norse Myths. This fabulously wealthy bishop and art patron was Snorri's foster brother. While I was gathering illustrations for this book, I stumbled upon the theory that the Lewis Chessmen had been made in Iceland at Bishop Paul's request. That meant Snorri would have known the artist, Margaret. In Song of the Vikings, I argued that Snorri was responsible of most of what we know about Norse mythology. I argued that he invented the genre of saga, which his countrymen developed into the masterpieces of world literature the Icelandic sagas are now Ex universally acknowledged to be. I included a picture of one of the Lewis queens in this book and referred to the Iceland theory in a caption. But there was no room in Song of the Vikings to develop the idea that medieval Icelanders may also be, have been exceptional visual artists as well as world-class writers. That idea <coughs> nagged at the back of my mind. I've been studying Icelandic since 1978. I've written several other books about Icelandic sagas, and I wondered why I'd never heard anything like this before about visual art in medieval Iceland. Was the author of this Icelandic theory a crackpot? 
I had a couple of good sources in Iceland who told me, no, he's a pretty respectable character. He was a member of parliament. <laughs> so I did some basic research in the Dartmouth College Library and found out that this theory was in fact a very old one. Frederick Madden of the British Museum, who was the first person to write about the Lewis Chessmen, the year they were rediscovered on the Isle of Lewis, in 1832, concluded that they had been made in Iceland in the 12th century. And yet, when civil engineer and chess aficionado Guðmund or Thorarinsson reintroduced this theory in 2010 at a seminar on the Lewis Chessmen in Scotland, he was ridiculed. Alexander Wolfe, a professor of medieval studies from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, was particularly dismissive. Responding to a reporter from the New York Times, Wolfe said that Iceland was too poor and backward to produce such stunning works of art. Quote, a hell of a lot of walrus ivory went into making those chessmen, and Iceland was a bit of a scrappy place full of farmers, he said. Wolfe's comment made me mad. <laughs> I had just spent several years researching and writing about 12th and 13th century Iceland. I knew he was wrong. Iceland was then at the peak of its golden age. It was independent, it was rich, it was in a frenzy of artistic creation. Here's how I describe the intellectual world that Bishop Paul and Snorri inhabited. Quote, I have mastered nine skills, bragged a young Norwegian poet in the early 12th century, putting a northern twist onto Petrus Alfonsi's list of the uh, things that a clerk should learn, riding, swimming, archery, boxing, hawking, chess, and verse writing. Kali hmm. Colson, who would become Earl Rogval Kali of Orkney, announced, I am eager to play chess. I have mastered nine skills. I hardly forget the runes. I am interested in books and carpentry. I know how to ski. My shooting and sailing skills are competent. I can both play the harp and construe verse. The word that Kali used for chess is top. Scholars have long disagreed about whether he meant the old game with one king, Nevatok, or chess, the new game with two. Judith Jess, a professor of Viking studies at the University of Nottingham, argues that the latter is very likely, in that chess was the latest fashion for young aristocrats in Northern Europe in the 12th century, and Kali was a very stylish guy. On a trading voyage as a youth, he went to England. On the way home, he stopped in Bergen, where he was spotted in a drinking hall, dressed in a showy fashion with his English gear. Another one of his poems also seems to refer to chess, using the term rocker in both its old meaning of scoundrel and its new meaning, the chess rook. By the time Kali's poems were set down in the Orkney Islanders saga around 1190, chess was well known throughout Europe. Most likely it was known in Iceland too, though the first datable reference to it is in Snorri Sturluson's Heimskringla, written between 1220 and 1241. The Orkney Islanders saga was one of Snorri's sources for his history of Norway's kings. Its author is thought to be Snorri's foster brother, the future bishop, Paul Johnson. Jonsson, I should say. Both Snorri and Paul grew up at Odi, Jan Lofsson's main estate at the south of Iceland, though they did not live there at the same time. They were 23 years apart in age. Paul, born in 18, excuse me, 1155, was in the Orkney Islands when his father, to settle a feud, offered to raise and educate his adversary's three-year-old son. This boy, Snorri Sturluson, grew up to become Iceland's richest and most powerful chieftain, twice its law speaker, and one of the most influential writers of the Middle Ages. His works are our main source books for Norse mythology, the poetry of the Viking Age, and the early history of Norway. Snorri's life and works, even more than Kali Colson's poem, tell us, let us guess what skills Paul Janssen knew. Poetry, the myths on which skaldic verse draws for its metaphors, the history of the North, genealogical lore, Icelandic law, and the rhetoric required to win a lawsuit. Paul, too, was taught chant and church Latin, 
Snorri apparently was not, for in 1190, the Archbishop of Trondheim decreed that chieftains could no longer be ordained priests. Latin became superfluous for a chieftain's son. Paul may also have been exposed to Hebrew and Greek, as well as Latin. At some point between 1125 and 1175, a scholar at the Adi school drew from all three languages to create a new alphabet and a set of rules for spelling Icelandic. So that gives you a little sense of what Iceland was like in the late 1100s. Let me continue. Let's see. In Bishop Paul's day, around the year 1200, Iceland was at the peak of its golden age rich, independent, and in a frenzy of artistic creation. Though its population at 40,000 was one-seventh that of Norway, Iceland had long provided the skalds or court poets of the Norwegian kings. Now Icelanders became the official biographers of kings Sverre, who ruled Norway from 1184 to 1202, Hauken, 1217 to 1263, and Magnus, 1263 to 1280. From 1118 through the 1300s, medieval Icelanders produced prose works at an enormous rate. Measured against the handful of medieval Norwegian texts that we have, Iceland's literary output was prodigious. First came a law book, next a history of the island, commissioned by Iceland's two bishops. After this book of the Icelanders came chronicles of the kings of Norway and Denmark and the earls of Orkney, stories of Iceland's first settlers, Treatises on grammar, astronomy, medicine, poetics, and mythology, annals, saints' lives, sermons, and collections of miracles, biographies of bishops, and the history of Christianity in the country, translations of Bede, Isidore of Seville, <coughs> Sallust, Elucidarius, Physiologus, St. Gregory's Dialogues, and the Prophecies of Merlin, romances and fantastical tales of trolls and dragons, werewolves and sorcerers, Stories of Greenland, of Viking raids, of voyages to Constantinople or to the New World, of famous feuds and love affairs, of poets and outlaws, even a guide to the Holy Land. More medieval literature exists in Icelandic than in any other European language except Latin. And this was that scrappy place full of farmers. farmers. <laughs> he has since recanted. <laughs> And he hasn't met me either. <laughs> so, a little bit more about Bishop Paul, who's quite a fascinating character. Born in 1155, Paul was the great grandson of King Magnus Berlegs of Norway, who conquered northern Scotland, the Hebrides, and the Orkney and Shetland Islands, and took his nickname, Berlegs, from his fondness for wearing kilts. <laughs> King Magnus reigned from 1093 to 1103. His line ruled Norway through 1266, when northern Scotland and the Isles returned to the Scottish crown as part of the Treaty of Perth. During that century and a half, King Magnus's Icelandic kinsmen routinely visited Norway, where they were recognized as royalty. Connections between Iceland and the Scottish Isles were equally tight. Bishop Paul's brother, Simon, was betrothed to the daughter of the Earl of Orkney, but the wedding was never held. The two families could not agree on which had the higher status and which should be forced to sail to the wedding. <laughs> Bishop Paul himself became, in his youth, a retainer of Earl Harold, who ruled the Orkney Islands and Caithness in northern Scotland, and sometimes controlled Lewis and other islands in the Hebrides as well. Paul attended school in England, probably at Lincoln Cathedral, where his uncle, Bishop Thorlock, had also studied. Back in Iceland, Paul became a wealthy chieftain. Married and with four children, he was known for the breadth of his book learning and his excellent Latin, the extravagance of his banquets, the beauty of his singing voice, and his love of fine things. So, skip a little here. Now, we know all this because of the saga of Bishop Paul, which may have been written by Paul's own son, Loft. As Loft describes his parents, Paul and Herdus, they were well matched. She excelled at creating wealth, 
the bishop at spending it. <laughs> Paul liked nothing better than a lavish feast with wine to drink and the finest delicacies to eat. Like a chieftain of old, he sent his guests home laden with lavish gifts. He sent gifts abroad, too, to his fellow bishops in Greenland and Norway and the Orkney Islands, to the Archbishop of Trondheim, perhaps even to Norway's kings, to whom he was related. No Gregorian reformer, Paul limited the delivery of sermons to special days. He took no interest in his countrymen's morals or in who held the deed to which church, as his predecessor had. Instead, he commissioned or wrote music, like the office for St. Thorlach, which still exists, and books including The Miracles of St. Thorlach, The Saint's Life, a collection of homilies, and the church chronicle called Hunger Waker, with its charming tale of Bishop Isley and the polar bear. And Paul beautified his church, sparing no expense. He surrounded himself with the finest artists in the land, four of whom are named in his saga. Amundi the smith, Atli the scribe, Thorstein the shrine smith, and Margaret the adroit. This lover of fine things, Bishop Paul Janssen, had the means, the motivation, and the taste to commission the Lewis Chessman. Now, one of the reasons the scholars like Alex Wolf, who are interested in the Lewis Chessman, don't know this about Bishop Paul is that they consider the Icelandic sagas to be fiction, and some of the sagas are. The word saga comes from the Icelandic verb seya, to say. It does not imply either fact or fiction. But there are over 140 extant sagas. The saga of Bishop Paul is as factual as any medieval chronicle can be. It falls into the category of contemporary sagas. These sagas were composed within a generation of the actions they described. Their authors, some of whose names we know, were often eyewitnesses to the events. The saga of Bishop Paul is also backed up by archaeology. According to the saga, Paul was buried in a stone sarcophagus. So let me read another passage here. Bishop Paul's sarcophagus is the only one mentioned in Icelandic records. The country has no tradition of stone sculpture. The ubiquitous black basalt rock is brittle and not easily shaped. Rock walls are either lacy extravagances of dry stone construction or sutured together with layers of turf. The first stone church was not built until the 18th century. Even Icelanders did not believe the saga account of Bishop Paul's sarcophagus until they found it. <laughs> After the Reformation, Skalholt, which is the name of the bishop's say, Skalholt's importance plummeted. Throughout the Middle Ages, Skalholt had been the closest thing Iceland had to a town. The current capital city, Reykjavik, was merely a small farm. Yet in 1789, an English visitor could describe Skalholt as, quote, 12 or 15 houses, or rather, hovels. Let's see, where are we? In the mid-1900s, around the time Iceland declared its independence from Denmark, an association formed to resurrect Skalholt. Its members raised money to build a new church on the same hill where churches had always stood. Some far thinkers in the group commissioned an excavation first. It took place from 1954 to 1958, and the results have only been published in Icelandic. Quote, from the beginning of our researches, wrote archaeologist Christian Eldjarn, who later became the president of Iceland, the well-known words from the saga of Bishop Paul were in the back of our minds. It was late in the season, and they were at the level of the huge cross-shaped medieval basilica, the largest wooden church in all of Scandinavia, whose floor plan Bishop Kleine had first set out in 1152, and which had been rebuilt after being damaged by fires several times. On a day when the chief archaeologists were all away, one of the workers digging in the southern arm of the cross struck stone. Of all the things that came to light during the excavations of Skalholt, said Eldjarn, the grave of Paul Janssen is the most important and meaningful. It is not certain that another such sign and wonder of the Icelandic sagas could ever be unearthed. 
So what about Margaret the Adroit? Here's where she comes into the story. Margaret the Adroit would have remained a colorful detail in a little red saga. There's never been an English translation, by the way. If the Icelanders had not decided to build that new modern church at Skaholt and called first for an archaeological excavation. The existence of Paul's sarcophagus vouches for the overall truth of the saga of Bishop Paul. The ivory crozier found inside it calls to mind the one Margaret carved out of walrus tusk, the saga says, so skillfully that no one in Iceland had seen such artistry before. The crozier described no longer exists as far as we know. Paul commissioned it for Thorir, who became Archbishop of Trondheim in 1205, and supposedly sent it to him in Norway. But many experts attribute the crozier that was discovered in Bishop Paul's sarcophagus to Margaret. <coughs> and we have a little more. All we know about Margaret the Adroit comes from the saga of Bishop Paul. She is mentioned in no other source. And Loft, Paulson, says excruciatingly little about her. We learn that she lived at Skalholt as the wife of an important priest. Her high status excused her from the day-to-day -day drudgery of an ordinary farm woman, milking and cheese making, spinning and weaving. But she likely had some managerial role, especially after the death of Paul's wife, Herdis, when the official role of housekeeper was taken up by Paul's 14-year-old daughter, Thora. Upon Paul's own death in 1211, Margaret and her husband took complete charge of Scalpold for five years until the new bishop was named in 1216. And just to give you an idea of how big a task that was, the bishop owned about half or a quarter of Iceland at that time, including two harbors, the Westman Islands, most of southern Iceland, uh, southern, that's part of southern Iceland. He was in charge of 220 churches, each of which had one priest and often more than one. And he received the tithe from over 3,000 farms in Iceland. And who knows what he did with it. <laughs> he did not send it all away. Along with croziers and altarpieces that we know are mentioned in the saga, Margaret may have carved practical things spoons, combs, weaving tools. She may have had a fine hand at embroidery or tablet weaving, we'll never know. Loft is not interested in Margaret the Adroit. What he wants to talk about is his father's and his own importance. Loft, it seems, acted as his father's emissary, bringing gifts to the Bishop of Orkney and the King of Norway, and it is within this context of reciprocal gift exchange that he remembers Margaret. His association of her skill in ivory work with Paul's propensity to send, quote, precious things as gifts to his friends abroad is our best clue that Margaret made the Lewis Chessman. The saga of Bishop Paul is hard going, even if you studied Old Icelandic and no English translation exists. Loft clearly was not much of a stylist. His memories drift and wander across the page like the recollections of an old man looking back many years. Reading between the lines, we can reconstruct his train of thought. The honor he was shown on his travels from 1208 to 1210 took visible form. Though he doesn't describe the wonderful gifts he received from the bishop, king, and earl, they remind him of the beautiful gloves and the gold ring and the embroidered mitre Sent, it, sent to his father in 1210, and which perhaps he himself delivered from Archbishop Thorir of Trondheim. Next in the cascade of remembrances come the treasures sent by Bishop Nicholas of Oslo in 1211, another gold ring, this one set with a large gemstone, and a great quantity of aromatic balsam, which was blended with oil to make the consecrated chrism used in baptism, extreme unction, and other Christian rites. A gift demands a gift, as the old Icelandic saying goes. Loft recalls that his father sent many gifts to his friends abroad, both gear falcons and other treasures. The mention of gear falcons hints at what those other treasures might have been made of. These large white falcons, prized as hunting birds, were one of Greenland's most valuable exports. Another key export from Greenland, of course, was walrus tusk. 
the raw material for the next treasure loft mentions, the walrus ivory crozier carved by Margaret the Adroit. Perhaps Paul sent it to Archbishop Thorir, who was elected in 1205, by way of the 18-year-old loft in 1208. In thanks, Thorir sent back with loft the mitre, ring, and gloves. Growing up at Skalholt, Loft knew Margaret the Adroit. He watched this spectacular object being made so skillfully that no one in Iceland, particularly not the young author, had seen such artistry before. He could have told us much more about her in this jumbled account. Instead, he dismisses her with the intriguing line, but Margaret made everything that Bishop Paul wanted. What else did he want? Besides a crozier and an altarpiece? How marvelous if Loft had written. The second thing she carved was a board game skillfully made of walrus ivory. The board game was both for the old game with one king and the new game with two. But he didn't. Those sentences come from the saga of Reth the Sly and concern a fictional ivory carver from Greenland. All they tell us is that someone in 13th century Iceland, when this saga was written, thought that a walrus ivory chess set made a good gift for a king. So why does it matter who carved the Lewis Chessmen, their beautiful works of art, regardless? According to a curator at the British Museum in London, which owns all but 11 of them, quote, few objects compete with the Lewis Chessmen in terms of their popular appeal. As the earliest chess sets to include bishops, among the first with queens, and the only ones to use Viking berserks as rooks. They are, quote, the most famous and important pieces in history, says one chess expert. <coughs> to Scottish nationalists, their symbolic value is extraordinary. Remember, they were found in Scotland. Leading up to the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence, the Scottish Democratic Alliance issued a policy paper titled The Future Governance of Scotland in a list of five points for which, quote, there is a need for an agreed exit strategy from the UK. Number three read, negotiation on division of the UK assets, oil, financial, military, Lewis Chessman, etc. <laughs> <laughs> they are Harry Potter's chess set. Before the life or death match in the film Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry learns wizard's chess from the Lewis Chessmen. They are in the Disney Pixar film Brave, teaching the princess about war and chaos and ruin. They appear in the seventh seal, Beckett, and the lion in winter. They grace the cover of an Agatha Christie mystery. They figure in the plots of a 2011 children's book by Francesca Simon of horrid Henry fame. A 2012 story in the Doctor Who series and in the 2013 thriller by Peter May. Poems have been written about them, and songs. Sing Scol Scottish balladeer Dougie MacLean. Out of an age when time was young, across the silver ocean's floor, they come with tales too dark to speak, but the fascination holds, compels us on to search and seek. To art historians, they are outstanding examples of Romanesque art that embody truly monumental values of the human condition. Let me read again. The Lewis Chessmen, noted an expert on Romanesque art, are psychologically charged to a degree unusual in 12th century sculpture. They show a spontaneity and vividness of a worldly kind missing from most art of the time. Compared to other ivories, added another, the Lewis Chessmen are wholly naturalistic and remarkably accomplished in their execution. They are simple but powerful, concluded a curator at the British Museum. The coherent and self-confident style of the Lewis Chessman is virtually without parallel. Indeed, there is much uncertainty about the origins of the Chessman, both about their style and their date. This is due to a lack of comparable surviving material. There seem to be no counterparts for the very simply draped, compact, and expressive human figures with their strong and forceful faces. Like Bishop Paul's Crozier, the Lewis Chessmen are whimsical and bold and not wholly appropriate. They are the work of an artist who could capture the individuality of a face, of an emotion, 
of a moment in time. They are the work of an artist with a keen sense of humor and a light heart. That artist could have been Margaret the Adroit. So, one more point to make. Based on the type of miter the bishops wear, everyone agrees that the Lewis chessmen must have been carved after 1140, when Episcopal fashions began to change. The standard story is that they are made of walrus ivory sent from Greenland to the Archbishop of Trondheim in Norway as part of the Christian Greenlanders' tithe. The chessmen were carved in 12th century Trondheim, then sent by merchant ship to Dublin, Ireland, and the ship wrecked on the Isle of Lewis in Scotland's outer Hebrides, and the chessmen were lost. They were found on Lewis in 1831. What's true about this story is that they were made of walrus tusk, all except for four that are made of whale's tooth, and that they were found on Lewis. Everything else is speculation. Art historians usually assume, in the absence of other evidence, that an object was made close to where it was found. And you could make a case that the Lewis chessmen were made on the Isle of Lewis, in the Orkney Islands, or somewhere else in Scotland. You could also argue, with just as much factual evidence as we have for Trondheim in Norway, that they were made in Lund, which was then in Denmark, that is now in Sweden, or in Greenland, where the walrus ivory came from, or, as I argue, in Iceland by Margaret the Adroit. In that first passage I read you, I said, history too has many pieces missing. To play the game, we fill the empty squares with pieces of our own imagination. And that's the thought I'd like to leave you with tonight. Thank you. Yes. Oh, a very small question. Do the Faroe Islands come into all of this? Yes, um, because they were a way station between Norway and Scotland, and also Norway and Iceland. So they were very much part of this world. Okay. But there is no walrus ivory there. Okay. And I don't want to call them a scrappy place full of farmers, <laughs> but I don't know much about. We don't know much about the culture of the Faroe Islands at that time because we don't have any texts okay. from there. Uh, there is quite a lot of archaeology, though. So they were definitely part of the, the Viking world, the Norse world at that time, an important part. Yes. Uh, to what extent might it be possible that further uh, examples of the saga literature might turn up? They have been looking. Um, I don't think we'll get any more sagas. A, a very unfortunate incident happened in the 17th century where most of the saga manuscripts were collected in Iceland. That was both fortunate and unfortunate. They were collected in Iceland and taken to Copenhagen to be studied. They were in three different libraries in Copenhagen and then there was a big fire in oh, Copenhagen. Right and I believe two out of three of the libraries were destroyed. Wow. So many of the original manuscripts were saved. Some of them were in the Royal Library, which was not harmed, uh, but there was a lot that was lost that we don't have paper copies of. They were making paper copies of them at that time, so when I say that the manuscripts were saved, the texts were saved, but the parchment may have been lost. So we only have, for example, one copy of some sagas or, or eddas. So it's, you know, there's a lot that was lost. And I don't think there's a lot hiding in Iceland because they have been looking very carefully. Yeah. I'm interested in your context for researching and writing. Are you part of a group or are you just doing this on your own? I am just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really, I'm jealous of the authors who have these acknowledgments pages that go on and on and on about their photo researcher and their uh, library researcher and all that. And no, it's just me. Are, and you're not connected with an academic I am institution. independent, uh -huh. yeah, which is also I mean, unfortunate sometimes, but also lets me do what I want to do. Yeah. I have, uh, because this is my third or fourth or fifth book, depending how you're counting, about Iceland, I now have a very good network of contacts in Iceland. And they often say, but Nancy, you can't say that. And I say, 
Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> you are a history professor. You're an archaeology professor. You have to stay within your discipline. I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm able in this kind of book to bring in speculation and say, yes, this is speculation. Isn't it fun? But I can also point out that you know, the Trondheim <coughs> theory, which you will find in any book about the uh, Lewis Chessman, they were made in Trondheim between 1150 and 1200. It's totally speculation. We have no proof. And I, you know, when trying to examine the Iceland theory and say, okay, is this valid or not? I found, by the way, that there's no basis for the Norwegian theory. And you could make a really good one for Lund in Sweden if you wanted to. So it's just that nobody's done it. And in some cases, nobody's published it in English. Because the Iceland theory has been published in Iceland several times. Who reads Icelandic? <laughs> you know, people who write about the Lewis Chesper generally are in England and Scotland. So, yes? You inspired me with both the etymology here. Okay. Did you say that the piece we call the Rook was called by a name that meant scoundrel? The Icelandic word, Rokur, meant scoundrel. Mm -hmm. But the word Rook comes from the Arabic, Rook, which meant chariot. Chariot. The original chess set was an Indian army, a Hindu army. And so the rooks were charioteers with three horses. The bishops were elephants. Oh, well, there's a knight in the middle. The knights were knights, or horsemen. Then the bishops were elephants. So they're warriors sitting on top of an elephant. And then you, instead of having a king and a queen, you had a king and his counselor, or vizier. So that was the chessboard that came into Europe. Uh, we have a text from 997 that describes how to play chess, and we have a chess set from 1008. So we know it came in before then, but it was in the Arabic countries 500, 600. So there's a big blank spot in the history of chess. How did it get to Europe? The very first text has a queen. How did she get in there? some theories in here. There's also a very good book by Marilyn Yalom called The Birth of the Chess Queen, if you really want to go into that. Um, and then the question of the bishop. How did an elephant turn into a bishop? <laughs> Obviously they didn't know what elephants were. If you're going to take a war game and turn it into a northern European war game, you're not going to have elephants. But why would you put a churchman on the board? Why would you have a churchman fighting, especially at this time when the Gregorian reform had been in place since around 1,000 something? 200 years the church has been trying to tell bishops, you are not allowed to fight with <coughs> weapons. You are not allowed to take part in disputes that have weapons. You are to be apart from the world. You are not the king's servant. The king is your servant. So I have a whole chapter on that. But it's a very interesting question. How did the bishop get on the board? And we also have our little berserkers as rooks. Mm -hmm. There's one guy in here biting the top of his shield yeah. who is just absolutely gorgeous. There's four of them that bite the tops of their shields, so that's how we know they were supposed to be berserk warriors. Mm -hmm. But they are only found in, in Norse. I think you had yours up first. Would you tell us a little bit about the ivory itself and what research has been done on the ivory is the walrus yeah. ivory. Yeah. Um, you can tell that, I don't think I have a picture. You can tell that if you turn them upside down because you can see the core. Mm. Walrus ivory has a very grainy, marbly, lumpy kind of core. One curator said it looks like popcorn. Mm -hmm. And depending on the size of the tusk, you might have a lot of core and only a very little bit of carvable ivory. You know, the side of the tusk and where you are in the tusks. They could be actually, I think, 36 inches. You know, we, we usually see them like this, but they could actually have been quite big. Still, they were nowhere near as big as an elephant tusk. And elephant tusks have the primary dentine all the way through except for a tiny little blood vessel. They don't have this marbly core. So in the Lewis chessmen, you can see where sometimes the outer ivory was so thin that they actually carved the core. So you can see this marbly kind of stuff. And many of them you can turn upside down and you can see the 
the core and the, you know, the thin rim of the primary dentine. The, they call the core the secondary dentine. Some of them you can't gather. Yeah, some of them that the ivory is so beautiful and strong and well polished that you turn it upside down and you don't see any difference. But there are enough of them that you can tell. They have not done any physical or chemical tests on the chessmen. When I asked repeatedly, I was told that to take a sample, even of a teeny, 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 tiny little bit of sample of the inner part of the core, and these days you need like a fingernail pairing, would be to cause harm. Mm -hmm. And a curator at an art museum cannot cause harm to his objects or her objects. So David Caldwell, who talked to me about this quite a lot, he's retired from the National Museum of Scotland, he said possibly he could have done it because he's been the curator of these chessmen for 30 or 40 years. But once he retired, no one else would have had the moral authority to say that it's important to take a piece out of one of the chessmen. Now, there are 59 face pieces, and some of them are in pretty bad shape. And I don't see any way you couldn't have taken a little bit from the inside and anybody would notice it, but no. He also pointed out that the two tests that we can do on bone or tusk, one is carbon dating and the other is an isotope analysis. An isotope analysis can tell us where the tusk came from. But we know because of a lot of historical information that it's very, very likely it came from Greenland because almost all of the ivory, walrus ivory, in Europe in the 12th and 13th century came from Greenland. Uh, they have been digging up farms in Greenland and they're finding walrus chips on every single one. It was a huge industry in Greenland. Mm -hmm. So it could have come from northern Norway, but it's less likely. Those herds had been hunted pretty hard by then. They were not the main source. The herds in Iceland were extinct by then. <coughs> so everybody agrees they came from Greenland. Why do we need to know? The other question is carbon dating. Carbon dating gives you a range of dates and it usually can only get within maybe 50 years, 100 years. You can't narrow it down much more than that as I understand it. And this whole argument over whether they could have been made in Norway or in Iceland uh, pretty much swings on a 20 to 25 year span. They were made before a certain time. Norway's claim is a little bit stronger. If they were made after a certain time, Iceland's claim is a little bit stronger. So it wouldn't tell you enough. Is it logical that ivory would go from Greenland to Iceland at yes. that time? Yeah, that's another okay. argument that I, I push in here. Um, the bishops owned the ships. And we have a very good trail I think of connections between people who worked at the bishop's um, cathedral whose uncle was known to be in the Greenland trade and who came into a certain harbor that's owned by the bishop's foster brother and you know there's this connection of <coughs> we think the bishop was heavily importing ivory and had family connections to do it so it's 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 being, it's sort of a new idea even in Iceland right now that ivory was coming from Greenland to Iceland and being worked on and then going elsewhere. And they are finding more and more bits of ivory in Iceland. They just discovered a number of things in Reykjavik that they had not expected. And the people who discovered that are now putting together, well, where else have we found ivory? And they're charting it now all over the country and, and for hundreds of years. And they say, well, wait a minute. The, the herds couldn't have lasted that long. So, anyway. Mm. Yes? Um, we've, so we've had the joy of seeing them in Scotland. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Those I are the ones I got to touch. Oh. Mm -hmm. Just four of them. Oh yeah, boy, I would have loved to reach into the case, but I yeah. know what would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, we tend to color the chest pieces, and uh, the ones in the case are not black. They're more um, like this. Yes. Yeah, and I was just like wondering, that. is there evidence, remains of any kind, that indicate that they were colored? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. um, they were maybe not discovered, but they were put up for sale in 1831, and they were bought by many of them by the British Museum then. And the first person to examine them was Frederick Madden, who was the keeper of assistant keeper of manuscripts or something like that at that time, and also a chess player. He records in a hundred page long treatise that tells you absolutely everything you could ever want to know about these chess pieces that some of them were colored red. Since then, the color has faded. Um, David Caldwell and his colleagues did tests on every single chessman for a book they put out in 2010, could find no traces of any color. So we suspect that somebody in the 19th century cleaned them. <laughs> clean them. Uh, we don't know. But there is another record in an Icelandic annal of a shipwreck. Okay, the, the story is written down like in the 1500s and the shipwreck took place in the 1200s, so we have to kind of take the with a grain of salt. But there was a shipwreck off the west coast of Iceland that one of the bishop's ships coming from Greenland was wrecked and strewed walrus tusks up and down the shore. And he said, in the 1500s, we are still finding tusks from that wreck with the owner's names marked in red. So that gives us an understanding that there was some way of dyeing or coloring walrus ivory red that might have lasted for a long time. There's also a, a 13th century <coughs> art book from Germany that gives lots of instructions on how to make certain things, and he tells you how to dye ivory red. Mm -hmm. Those guys get to be black. They're resin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the originals were not that color. The originals color. were not that color. Oh. Um, these replicas are made uh, from the British Museum or the Scottish National Museum as working chess sets. Mm -hmm. So they'll give you one side in white and one side in black or brown or red or whatever is the color of the year. And um, this one I got in the 1980s, and it was really a very well-made one. And this one I just got recently. And the molds are kind of wearing out. <laughs> you get less features now than you got in the 1980s. So if you can find antique ones, they're, they're much better. But they do tend to change what color they make them. A question about the language. I was told yesterday that Old Norse and Icelandic are the same. Yes. If you can read Icelandic, you can read Old Norse. And you have to learn a slightly different spelling, and um, the pronunciation is sometimes a little different, but it's like us nowadays reading Shakespeare. Oh, okay. It's that close. And would you give us an example of what Icelandic sounds like? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Somebody wanted to talk to me in Icelandic. I could do that, but I can I can recite a poem. Oh, okay. That's Norwegian. Yeah, it is a little Norwegian. Yeah. Norwegian was Old Norse, but then it changed. Yeah. And Danish was Old Norse, and then it changed. So Iceland kind of retained the original. And, and that a is. Uh, sound to it, also. it could. There's a lot of Gaelic, uh, then there's a lot of Irish people that came to Iceland. Uh, but it is a very, very old language with enormous amounts of grammar. Uh, several years ago, uh, Benjamin Bagby uh, yeah. recited mm -hmm. the, the Wolf, or the, the first third of it here. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that when he performed it in Iceland, uh, many people could understand. They could understand. Yeah. Him. They could I understand know. the old English. Well, I got into Old Icelandic through Old English. And I think most scholars do. You often learn them as a pair. They have a lot of the same sounds, the same uh, alphabet. And back in those days, people could speak to each other in Old Icelandic or Old Norse and Old English. It's like maybe like us going to Scotland, and sometimes you wonder, are they really speaking English? <laughs> or maybe parts of India, you know, where they have a very heavy accent and a lot of words you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even the deep south here. <laughs> what is the root of the two, Old English and Old Norse? I would say Old Norse, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, back further. Yeah, it, 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 you'd have to get a philologist to go back farther than that. 
I think they're considered Germanic That's languages. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but I, I argue moved, in, in you know, Song of the Vikings that they're called Germanic because a German scholar studied it. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> I think German is a Scandinavian language, but, oh. right. you know, it's well, they politics. they had the same gods for a while, so. Yeah, it's yeah. politics. Right. Yeah. So yeah. how we, how we like decide it. what is, you know, the, uh -huh. the, the root stuff. and what is the overall <laughs> is politics. Uh -huh. Well, this has been great. Thank you so Thank much. You very much.